Welcome to a special episode of the AEG Show. Today we have a special guest from Crankage Games. We have Michael. And joining us as well, we have Dalton up, and man? Marlon. Pandera. <laughs> hey guys, what's up? <laughs> so our, our, our special guest for tonight, as I said just right now, it's uh, Michael from Crankage Games. He's an indie game, indie game developer. Uh, he's put out a couple games out on Steam. And uh, we're going to talk about... Uh, you know how he developed his games, what he's gone through to develop his games, what drives him to make his games, and uh, especially the type of games that he makes uh, are not for the faint of heart, not politically correct at all. And beautiful. So, so we're gonna get we're gonna get right into it. So, yeah, actually, just to give a little bit of context. If you're easily offended, hold on. If you're easily offended, go ahead and turn this episode off because I'm sure this is what's gonna get a little off the rails. So, yeah, <laughs> go ahead. I'm sorry, I had to put that. Yeah, in. That, that was your trigger warning because you won't be finding any safe spaces on this episode. No, absolutely not. <laughs> <laughs> so actually, I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna hand it off to uh, what ostensibly will be my co-host Dalton because he's the one who introduced us to uh, Crankage and his games and you know the type of stuff that he puts out. So Dalton, if you just want to kick it off. Yeah. First of all, man. Uh... Why don't you tell us about the games you've made? I know you've got a few on Steam. You've got a bundle that's constantly on sale, man. I mean, always on sale. The sale ended, and I remember you, like, a couple days later, you're promoting another one. So, mm-hmm. actually, I think you owe me a couple dollars because I made, like, 12 bucks, and it was on sale <laughs> for, like, 10 <laughs> yeah, yeah that may be. Um, well, uh, basically, the bundle the bundle price, uh, if you buy all of them in the bundle, it's always 20 23 percent off i believe is like the standard if you buy them individually you pay full price but if you get them all at the same time then yeah it's always on sale um but every week a uh a, essentially almost every week a new sale starts because each game goes on sale individually but they can only each game can only go on sale once every two months so depending on what game is on sale in the bundle it adds that to the uh the bundle sale so some weeks it'll be a little bit more some weeks it'll be a little bit less but the bundle is definitely the cheapest way to go always um as far as the games in the bundle uh the first game i made was metal as fuck um it's uh like an older retro style um rpg it's the longest game in the bundle uh it was my first first game there's you know plenty of flaws in there um learned a lot along the way but um it seems to be i think people's favorite as well um and then i've got the chronicles of quiverdick which was a spin-off of metal as fuck but you you don't have to play metal as fuck to get it um though there was like a essentially there was a favorite character in metal as fuck which was old man quiver um, or quiver dick that i ended up you know fans really liked it in metal as fuck so i threw him into uh his own game um <clears throat> then there's quiver dick's terrible tale for terrible parents to read to the equally terrible children um <laughs> that one <laughs> uh that one's it, it's more of a visual novel than than it is a uh, an rpg it's just got rpg aesthetics but um it's a pretty short one um i threw one or i threw that in there for, for it's just a buck you know it's more for promotional like hey you know, if you if you can't afford the other games, but you've always wanted to try them, try this one, see what you think. This is the type of humor. If you're hooked, then buy the rest of them, kind of deal. Um, then I've got uh, Damned Daniel. Um, Red Mouse Games was the developer of Damned Daniel. That one is a uh, a lot of people think is the most vulgar one in the bundle. Um, I wrote the original script for it. She took it, developed it over the course of a year and um adjusted the script added her own stuff in it came out really good a lot of people like that one um and then there's deported drain the swamp and deported build that wall so those are they were their own separate thing i wanted to take a break from the rpg style and i wanted to just do some sort of parody satire type thing they're the least it's funny they're they're the least offensive or least vulgar, I guess I should say. There's like hardly any swearing in them at all. Least vulgar um, out of any other game, but the most controversial and offensive to people. So, uh, <laughs> yeah. and, and my favorites. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we got Gustavo, our big, uh, our big conservative here. Um, <laughs> but yeah, like I said, don't 
you should have turned this episode off by now if you didn't want to hear this shit. So, um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's – so now do you get to decide when, when your games go on sale or is that like through Steam? Does Steam put your shit on sale or do you like give them a schedule to follow? Um, I get to decide when they go on sale, but I've got to wait the mandatory two months in between sales, except for holiday or seasonal sales. They let us know, um, when, like they give us about maybe a week to like 10 days notice. They're, they're basically like, Hey, there's going to be a sale coming up the summer sale or the winter sale, etc. If you want to participate in that sale, you can. And then that doesn't, um, that doesn't take away from the your sales going on sale once every two months. That's just like an added bonus for developers if they want to put it in for an extra sale. However, you do have to time your sales appropriately because if you if your game's on sale during that time, it goes on double sale, and then you end up like usually you losing out on a lot of money um, by doing it that way. So sometimes, um, for example, some seasonal sales uh, go on sale for two weeks at a time. Um, sometimes like I can put my game on sale, um, a week before a certain seasonal sale. Uh, but it's best to just wait the two weeks and then it, uh, you know, as far as business goes, you end up losing about two weeks off of your, your potential week long sale that you could get, but it's worth waiting a lot of times. It's a lot of, um, so it's, it's a lot of trial and error. I found out the hard way. Uh, dealing with sales and stuff, and when the best times to put them up for sale were. Um, but yeah, I think I think a lot of people, a lot of developers, don't. They're not as um, knowledgeable about the. Yeah, yeah, on, they're on not. The business side. Yeah, I think they end up screwing themselves quite a lot, really. Is there is there any type of hand holding or any type of guidance from Steam at all? Uh, in in what way? In terms of in terms of the sales, as opposed, like you know, for example, like they'll give you some maybe some tips. Like, is it this the like, the Steam have a, a a team out there that will say, hey, listen, this is generally when you want to put them on sale or things like that. Um, you know, the the best that they do really is is they they say check out similar products and go from there kind of thing. That's they they mm-hmm. have a they've got a pretty decent guide, but it's not super in depth. It's a basics. It's a decent basics guide, which pretty much gets, um, a lot of developers by, I would say most of them, um, just on, you know, you can put it up this time. This is when you should be mindful. You should never release a game for X amount, etc. You know, we recommend releasing it between this price and this price, etc. stuff like that. Um, fairly basic, but, um, if you really, really want to maximize what um, what you can get out of your product, you got to do your own research. Gotcha. And how do you, how do you how do you feel about discoverability in the in the Steam store? And are you only on Steam? Are your games only on Steam? Uh, Deported. The first one is on Google Play as well, um, but but the rest of them are just on Steam exclusively right now. I tried going through Humble Bundle. Uh, they declined. Um, Be- because of the content, I, yeah. Because of the content, yeah. Wow. Uh, yeah. yeah. What um, about Epic Store then? Because they're they seem to be kind of allowing a lot of different things on that store. Um, and obviously, I've, they they take a smaller cut too. So yeah. Okay. So so as far as Epic, I get asked about this quite a lot. And you know, as much as I get asked about this, I really should do my research more on uh, on Epic to answer it properly. But I don't I don't know. Um, how privy you are to Epic's rules and guidelines and and stuff and restrictions, but maybe you can... Okay, so from what I heard, now this was back when Epic was first starting up, so I don't know how accurate this is, but it would vastly change my answer, or drastically change my answer, but from what I hear, Epic requires exclusivity. Now, I don't know how true that is. If it is true then it would mean that essentially I would have to go and leave Steam to go to Epic. Um, if that were the case, then I would say that, because uh, a lot of people ask, is is Epic worth going to? How's that as an alternative? Because they take a lesser cut, things like that. Um, I would say that it very much depends on what your game is and how many places you're going to put it, because Steam not only doesn't require exclusivity, they actually give you unlimited amount or uh, 
just at least an obscene amount of free keys and recommend that you go sell it in other places. Um, if you sell the game on your own, you get 100% of the money. They don't take any cut, and they can run it through the Steam store for you. Um, so Steam does a pretty good job at letting you have freedom. Um, if I were to sell keys just straight from my own website, I would get 100% of it, and they would just run their game through Steam, um, and, and Steam would host that. Um, if I want to go to Humble Bundle, which while Humble Bundle declines me, they basically said, while we don't want the game on the store, here's a widget. You can set up your games. You can sell them. You just have to do the advertising on your own. So that's what I did. So Steam, you get Steam keys from Humble Bundle for my games. I get like the, I believe 95% of the sales. I think, I think Humble takes 5% from that. Um, you know, so so I'm able, and, and again with Google Play, um, I'm able to sell the games on Google Play as well. Now, if I were to go through the Epic Store, if again, now I don't know how accurate it is, but from what I heard, they I wouldn't be able to go through all those avenues. So the Epic Store would have to do a good enough job paying developers solely from their own thing if they're not going to let other people, or if they're not going to let them go elsewhere to sell their product. So I've I've got a, one takeaway and one question. The takeaway being that I find it odd that Humble Bundle would decline you. They don't want the games on the store because of the content, but they were able to work with you or, or were willing to work with you and letting you have a widget from which to sell them through. So they're not declining you on ideological grounds. They're just declining you for business reasons. Yeah, correct. Yeah. Which, I, which, yeah. Which, which sort of makes sense. And then my second question, it's again regarding Steam. Uh, I don't know if you're aware of this new policy that they have in order to compete better with other platforms such as Epic, in which you know the more your game sells, I think if it sells upwards of five million or a million, I could be wrong on the exact numbers, they take a lesser cut, and I think that ostensibly that hurts smaller creators like yourself, as opposed to the big AAA publishers who don't need any more of that money. Like, what's your take on that? Um, okay, so <clears throat> I guess my take on that would be. I'm not so I'm I'm not sure it hurts smaller developers so much simply because they were never going to get to that point anyways. Like um I think that I think that that's actually been a thing. It's just that that's now public knowledge. I think that when you're a company like Bethesda or um just just bigger bigger name companies in general i believe you have a lot more bargaining power um and you could just negotiate your contracts i believe that if you were to come to steam because steam is very uh secretive about um about what percent that you're supposed to get nobody is really supposed to tell anybody in public like this is how much i get now there's there's the baseline common knowledge um of what they take Right, you know that's that's, you know that's that's the baseline. However, I I can guarantee you that not all companies have that have that contract, um, because each each person is considered a partner when they sign up with Steam. Some businesses, like again Bethesda, generate a lot more revenue for Steam than than a lot of creators. So if they're putting Elder Scrolls on the Steam store, you can guarantee you that they're like, mm, you know, we're bringing you a lot more money. How about you take a fifteen percent cut instead? You know, I'm sure that, you know, I'm sure that, uh, I'm sure that that's because it because it becomes it becomes to the point where Steam couldn't say no because that's a lot of money they would be missing out on because Bethesda doesn't need Steam. You know what I mean? Correct. Um, so it's it becomes a mutual like how does this mutually benefit? both companies. So I would say that that's actually not something that's new. I think that's just newly public knowledge. Yeah. Yeah, fair enough. And obviously Valve and Steam being like probably one of the biggest platforms on PC, if not the biggest. It's probably the biggest, right? At this point. Yes. Yeah. Um, so you, you, you want your games on there. You might have to pay a sure. little bit more in comparison to like Epic and all that stuff, but you, your games on Steam, it's going to go further, at least as of right now. So you know, bigger population to yeah. choose from, basically. Um, mm-hmm. So do you? 
Go ahead, Marley. Actually, no, go ahead. Uh, do, you, do, you got, do, you, do you see an ebb and flow in sales depending on probably the season? Like, is, is there, I mean, I don't know for how long you, you've had your games on sale, but, but is there some sort of chart or graph that you have that you can say, okay, I know that around this time it's going to pick up because of, because of, you know, certain sales going on? Yeah, absolutely. Um, sales, sales typically uh, this time of year are fairly low compared to later in the year. Um, the, the, the best time. Um, now they say. Now this is one of the things that a lot of um, a lot of indie developers will probably benefit from learning is, is that uh, towards the winter, towards um, towards. Uh, I would say November, December, January, um, partial, maybe the the later half of October. Those are typically your AAA months. Those are those. If you're releasing your games in those times, you're going to be competing with a lot of AAA titles coming out. Um, a lot are, are centered around the holidays. They try to release a lot before Christmas. Um, they it. So generally, as an indie developer, this is kind of known as the better time to be releasing your game for visibility, at least. Um, however, this is also the time of year where a lot of people have um, are are not they they have tighter wallets as well. Um, so for visibility's sake, this is an indie time if you can get your game out there, and and it's it's definitely easier to get it in front of more eyes. Um, then it just becomes, can you convince people to buy your product? Because enough people are going to see it at this time. They're not focusing on a lot of AAA titles, but they'll see it doesn't mean that they'll buy it. Um, now, as far as sales go, though, um, as far as the winter sale goes, the Halloween sale, um, I believe sometimes there, in November there's a Thanksgiving sale. Mm -hmm. um, and, and then the, the winter sale usually goes from December through January or at least partially um, those typically are, are my biggest sale periods is like the month of December in general um, and then leading in through January and that's where I probably make twice the money if not three times the money as any other month um, or, or range um, so so definitely it's, you want to take as much advantage of that time period as an indie developer as you can, um, because those are typically when the majority of games go on sale. People are getting a lot of, uh, you know, gift cards as presents for Christmas, or you know, people are like, "Hey, it's the holiday season. I'm going to buy this for my friends," you know, and and they they see like the little games, the indie games, and are like, "Damn, that's a good deal," and they're just spending. They they may never play the game, but they will buy it around that time, you know. Um, which actually brings me into it's a little bit off topic, but just um, just a I'll go for a, it. A statistic that I don't think a lot of people know: sixty percent of all purchases on Steam never get played. Um, so, so the fact that if oh, if yeah. you release a game, you know, sixty percent, sixty percent of your sales as a dev, as an indie developer, at least, I don't know what they would be for AAA titles, but. As an indie dev, 60% of uh, sales that you get, the player will never play them. They will never download them. They will just wow. simply buy them um, based on impulse. So they'll see it on sale. They'll be like, go ahead. And it's, and it's funny that you say that because there's a topic that I want to discuss with you later on in the show that involves something similar to that. That okay. involves how people not only they download the games, but the way that they actually play the games and as opposed to just you know for me the way i see it is when you buy something you're not obligated to play but you should at least give it some uh time to it you know like if i'm gonna buy you know ducktales for like the remaster edition for from steam i'm gonna play it for 35 45 hours even if the game is like you know 60 75 but that's just the way i sure. see it uh mm -hmm. i understand the fact that you told me about how the 60% of sales don't get played is because I do that all the time. I buy my girlfriend a lot of games on Steam and I probably will buy your games <laughs> for her. Well, she might not she might play it, she might not play it, but it's for the most part a lot. I buy her I want to say 30, she might 40. get triggered. <laughs> no, trust me. She 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 no, she's probably more conservative than you and she's really more <laughs> Not conservative about saying what she feels about something. <laughs> that's, 
that's for sure. <laughs> see that. Yeah, that's the problem, though. It, it helps you, obviously, with the sales numbers, but uh, people don't play them. People aren't going to review them, right? So yeah, yeah, you're not going to get absolutely. those reviews on Steam. And you can you can go into that a little bit if you want to because I've seen you post several times on Twitter about how reviews on Steam help a ton. I mean, you want to... Yeah. You know what's crazy is is uh, I, I feel like I'm the only one, I, I'm the only developer that I've seen pushing the whole review thing, and that helps everybody, is raising awareness. I think more developers need to, the problem is, is developers don't even know, you know, the developers don't even realize, because there's a major disconnect between being a developer and um, understanding the business. Um, huge, huge disconnect. Um so a lot of developers, they don't know what they're doing. They just made a game. They were like, awesome. The vast majority of them fail simply because they created a product, a great product. Usually, a lot of developers out there are very talented, a lot better than me as a developer. Um, but my games do a lot better than theirs do. And the reason is because I understand the business side of it, and they don't. They make a game, they put it out there, and they say, I hope it does well. Well, it's not going to. Not not, not if you just do that. Um, you can make the best product in the world. If nobody sees it, nobody knows it exists, then it's not going to sell. Um, it's real hard to get reviews. And the they don't quite understand because they don't get those reviews. So because they don't get the reviews, they don't see the success that comes with getting reviews. There's a major difference in sales between a game that's reviewed 10 times in a month um, versus a game that isn't. Uh, even if a game has 300 reviews versus a game that has 200, um, the game that has 200, if it's reviewed 10 times in the last month, it gets a recent rating, and that recent rating makes the Twitter algorithms, or Twitter, uh, Steam algorithms, um, pick up where that game now becomes more visible on the page on the Steam store, and now it sells more copies. Um, so it's very important to stay relevant always, to always be getting those reviews. Um, yeah. as, as soon as those reviews stop, your visibility stops, um, and then you're just kind of stuck in the water. Um, until you can do enough advertising. So if um, if games aren't getting reviews, if you're not pushing reviews, because that's the other thing that people don't understand, is that on average only 1 in 150 people that play your game will leave a review. Um, very, very, very few people leave reviews. However, one review can sell 50 copies on its own. Um, wow. It's... Yeah. And <clears throat> Go ahead. Oh, um, I was just going to say that it doesn't, uh, people say all the time, oh, you know, I really want to review the game, but I want to make sure that, I want to make sure that it's, it's well written and all this stuff. Most people are never going to read your review. That's not what sells it. A lot of times people, if there's a bunch of reviews on a game, nobody's going to sit there and read all of them. They're, you know, they're quick purchases. There's, they're, they're going to read a few and they're going to be like, this sounds good or this sounds bad. And they're going to make their decision after reading three or four reviews and they're going to move on. Um, they're certainly not going to read big lengthy reviews. They don't have time for that. You know, um, a lot of people, you know, they, they don't even read the description of the game. I would say the majority of them, they scroll through it, they scroll straight down to the reviews, and they're just like, this again, this sounds good or this sounds bad, and then they either purchase or they move on to the next one. There's a lot of competition out there. There's a lot of things that pique people's interest they don't have time to waste. Um, Absolutely. So, so, so the thing about reviews is that what makes them what makes them sell the copies is simply by leaving that review. It makes it where it pops up on way more pages. So just like the percentage, the percentage of positive versus negative as well um, is insanely important. Um, and not only the percentage, but just how many reviews you have. There are certain benchmarks. And again, this is all stuff that developers don't know. And it's not stuff that you'll even find online. Um, you know, I, I had to learn this all the hard way. But if your game, for example, if your game has less than 50 reviews, um, it's lumped into a certain category. And that's just anything sub 50. Now, it doesn't matter what percentage it is, you're stuck in that category. So if your game, let's say your game is, uh, this is what happened to me with Metal as Fuck. Um, I had 49 reviews. All of them were, were positive. It was 100% positive rated for the longest time. So 100%, 49 reviews. 
there were games that were ahead of mine that had 50 reviews and they were like 80% positive, but they were ahead. And the reason is because once you hit 50, it goes from just a simple positive rating to very positive or, you know, whatever it, but your game essentially leapfrogs all other games on the store. Um, that's sub 50 regardless of percentage. So I went from, I went from 49 reviews to 50 and I, and just that one review made it where my page stopped appearing on, or sorry, my, my store, my, um, my game stopped appearing on page 30 and it jumped to like page 12. So, which was a lot more visibility and sales quadrupled just based on that one review alone. Um, so there's certain benchmarks you have to get to. The first one is 10 reviews to get a rating. That's super important. The second one is 50 reviews to leapfrog all the games that are sub 50, which is 99% of them. Um, there's a lot of games on Steam. A lot of them don't ever make it to 50 reviews. Um, there's a lot of games that just people will never see because of that. Um, and then after that, it becomes 500 reviews is the next benchmark, which is very difficult to get. Um, and that really only applies, the 500 benchmark really only applies if you can keep your game above 95% positive. Because then that becomes into the overwhelmingly positive category, which there's only a handful of pages on Steam overall that have that. Most developers never see it. Um, in fact, the majority of those spots are taken up by indie devs rather than AAA titles because so pe people are a lot more critical of AAA titles, so they they're leave a lot more negative reviews on them. Um, <clears throat> so AAA titles typically don't make it to 95% plus positive and they don't hold it. So that's a way for indie devs to really take advantage of, um, of getting their, getting paid really is, uh, if they can just somehow manage to make a good enough product and get enough people to see it to get to that 95% plus, because if they do, then they'll be on steam's pay, like every sale there will always be on page one, two, or three. And that means way, way, way more sales. You know, if, if a single one of my game was at 95% positive and 500 reviews, I could probably stop making games. And, and that would be enough income. Um, it's a huge deal. But a lot of wow. people don't, don't make it. Huge deal. Well, so I know... Go, go. You want to go ahead? Yeah, just real quick. Um, I've been <clears throat> chopping at the bit for this one. So seeing how you basically explain how uh, the algorithm works in that sense, do you have any pointers that Steam could probably, you know, what they can do to change discoverability? Because based on what you said, it seems like a flawed system, whereas it really doesn't matter about the quality of your game. It just really matters about popularity in terms of, hey, I mean, the 95% positive rating is important, but, you know, you still have to hit those tiers of 50 and 500 re minimum reviews to, to get within, you know, to, to have the algorithm yank your game and, put it in a certain bracket, if you will. Like, sure. Based, based on that, like, what are your ideas to improve discoverability? Because that's one of the biggest things I hear about indie developers. It's just the lack of help from Steam in terms of having their games displayed on the store in a prominent position. Yeah, you know, <clears throat> uh, you know I, wish, I wish I were more qualified to answer what they could be doing better, just simply because I don't know how well they're doing compared to other people anyways, you know, like it's, I I'm inclined to say that they're probably doing a pretty good job. There's a lot of games on steam, you know, there are a lot and there's not enough room for, if you advertise all of them equally, well then they're all equally, you, you know what I mean? Like there's gotta be, I'm, I'm going to throw this up here and this is going to be very unpopular, but it's unpopular with me. This is something that I would never want them to do. I sure. think the mark, I think the market always speaks to, uh, you know, but mm -hmm. How about they start pulling the store and they're a little more selective about what they let in? Because, you know, no, no, I don't want to dump on developers. No developer wakes up and says, I'm going to make a bad game today. Right. I don't sure. think those I don't think those folks exist. But there's just a lot of like not amateur stuff on Steam. Sure. And I think that <laughs> has a lot has a lot to do with what's <clears throat> going on in terms of discoverability. Sure. OK, so. So as far as that goes, there's um, it's interesting because that's kind of how it was before uh, Steam Direct was a thing. Um, they had Steam Greenlight. Now there's way too many applications for um, developers saying like, "Hey, we want our game to be on uh, on the store." 
for Steam staff, like limited staff, to go through them and be like, yes, no, yes, yes, no, 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 yes. So they they opened it up to the public and, and the community, um, which was the millions of Steam users, and they said, look, this is Steam Greenlight. Vote on what you want to let through, and um, and then that that way the community decided yes on this, no on this. However, the community was extremely toxic and very, very critical of everything that passed through. And indie developers essentially very, very rarely ever got to put a game through. Um, it was it was rough. It was really, really rough. And a lot of people, a lot of solid developers missed out on their, their chance to, to have it on Steam before that point. So essentially, Steam did away um with with that and introduced steam direct and they said they said look um you know we're not going to police what comes comes through here we're going to let the fan base decide on what they want to buy if they like it then they're going to buy it and if they don't like it then they're not going to buy it and that's up to them you know as they should as they should i I do agree with that just to make it clear for the listeners that's how it should be um i think that i i I think that there are some games that most certainly probably should not be on Steam. Um, you know, and I'm not going to say that it's that it's necessarily because they're bad. I'm going to say that they're just straight up a scam. Um, you know, there are some games that are like, for example, there's um, there's a few developers that that um, are pretty well recognized, but I guess they're it's they're they're allowed to keep putting up stuff, you know, but. Um, they put out a new game every three days, and the games are not games at all. They're they're really not games. Um, you click like three times on the screen, and you win the game, and that's it. It's done in thirty seconds, and they're you know. But a lot of people, I I I can only imagine they put them up for ninety nine cents, um, but they've released like a hundred and twenty games or something under you know the developer's name, and um, I can only imagine that. They're very clickbaity. They're very jokey. So every time there's a sale, again, impulse buys. Um, a lot of people are never going to play them. They're never going, but they're going to spend the money on them. Um, and especially in the holidays, I know because I did it. You know, I I bought some of these games because I was like, you know, I was like, uh, I was like, I wonder what this is. And then I wondered for six months and I didn't play it. And then I went and I played it, and I was like, "Holy fuck! Like this, this isn't even a game, you know." So I would say that there's definitely some stuff up there that's that's, um, you know, that probably shouldn't shouldn't be, um, but but I guess that's the way it goes. Um, it makes sense. I mean, given the fact that it is such a big store, you're gonna have situations with that where sure. you're, you're gonna have developers and you're gonna have publishers where they're not there for to put up a good product they are just mm-hmm. there to get a quick buck and yep. and sometimes this happens it happens in any type of industry and it happens in any type of business uh you always are going to have that it's i find it fascinating that you were talking about how the the ebbs and flows of your business goes up because i see it all the time in in my neck of the woods when it comes to uh, my the, the the small business that i worked at because mm-hmm. we can see it like there's a pattern that goes throughout the year, you know, like as soon as, you know, March, April, June, those summer months start out, but you can see the downward spiral of just people not interested in like, you know, purchasing stuff. And it just goes back Mm -hmm. slowly back in September, October, November, and just like it peaks like around December, January, like it, it, it really is like, it does, it is not just for any small business, but it's just like overall for the industry, like just. It, it, it's funny that I that I see it like that. Also, mm-hmm. I drew some parallels with YouTube when you were talking about how the Steam works when it comes to the algorithm, because that's literally mm-hmm. how uh, YouTube pays you. It is about not how much you know your video content is, just how much views and reviews are getting on and on your clicks and for your videos, and that's basically what props it up and goes into the next tier, and that's what mm-hmm. pushes you towards like the features, you know, on YouTube. It's a it's a popular it's a numbers game because of the algorithm, but it's mainly a popularity thing. You know, it is sure. The, it's the more reviews you have, the more exposure you have, the more exposure you have, the more people are gonna buy it, the more people are gonna buy it, more exposure, and it's just a cycle that keeps feeding on itself. Mm-hmm. And yeah, 
so, so moving on over moving on over from steam real quick i just go, sorry go ahead dalton yeah, so I well, I just want to conclude this since we're like getting off the you know the reviews topic. Um, anyone listening to this, uh, please go leave a even if it's just a quick review, right? Just leave a yeah. review on his games. Any anyone you play, I know. Um, and better yet, buy them. Buy them all, yeah. <laughs> buy them. Buy the buy the bundle, save you some money. Um, uh, I know I left one on Steam, and I we all, I also put one up on our website, um, and I'll do that for each game you know that I play when I, I play. I appreciate them. it. Um, so I'll have one on all of them, including including Damn Daniel, which is which, like you said, is a red mouse game. Mm-hmm. Um, so it helps her too. Uh, so make sure you guys do that. Uh, leave a review. You've heard how important it is. So please, mm-hmm. I appreciate it. Thank you. So moving on over yeah. from from Steam, I just really want to get into into Mike's uh, you know game development and basically how do you come up with a with a with a project? How long do you usually uh, you know develop a game? Are you are you a one man team in, in which you know you said you wrote a script? Are you developing everything? Like how how does your game process work? Or what development tools are you using? Are you using things like Unity? Or are you using uh, Unreal? Like you know the, basically your whole development process. How that can you break it down for us please sure i can yeah i can try um <clears throat> so i started out as a one-man team um when i made metal as fuck i did all the development on my own for that i did the story um i did the developing i use rpg maker mv um for metal as fuck i used vx ace as a you know former um version of the program um it's a it's an engine that's that's got a negative stigma attached to it um because it's a very simple simple engine to use so a lot of people can uh can learn it fairly quick i had no no knowledge whatsoever um of game development i taught myself in six months from youtube tutorials um nice so 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 it's a it's a pretty simple program but it's also extremely powerful if you learn the ins and outs of it which i don't even like I, I, I probably don't even know, you know, fifty percent of what the program can do. Um, if you're really good with it, you can even make like first person shooters and stuff with it, but it's not what it's meant for. Um <clears throat> it's open source. So, uh yeah, yeah, yeah. There's like the community the community is really, really, really solid, very supportive. Um, a bit toxic at times, uh, among developers. Um but but very uh, very supportive. Uh, the best way I can describe the community is everybody wants you to do good. They just don't want you to do better than them. You know, <laughs> I, I, I think the I think crabs that in a bucket. Well. Yeah. Crabs um, in a bucket. You know, so so I think that uh, um, I, I, I guess I guess um, essentially uh, I use that program. Um, as a one man team, I didn't do the trailers. I don't do any of the trailers. Um, uh, Red Mouse Games did the Metal as Fuck trailer, the first two trailers. Um, and then, let's see, I released Metal as Fuck, then I got started on the Chronicles of Quiverdick, and um, I did, worked on, so Metal as Fuck took me six months. Um, the Chronicles of Quiverdick, I was six months into it, um, and then I started working with uh, Cheese Wheeze on Twitter, um, she did some development and she was, she wasn't as experienced with the program itself, but she had gone to school for, for software development and things. So she learned very quick and she was able to do a lot more of the advanced stuff that I, um, that I just didn't know how to do and which was really beneficial, um, helped a lot, made, made the game just feel a little bit more polished, um, and taught me a lot. So she worked on the Chronicles of Quiverdick. She worked on the trailer um, and put that out there. And then Quiverdick's Terrible Tale, same thing. Um, and then uh, Quiverdick's Terrible Tale took about mm, I want to say I want to say it took it took three months total, but it took about a month to build. Um, Damn Daniel was an entirely uh, different experience i wrote that script i passed it on to red mouse games that took her a year um deported was also a very different experience so deported 
uh, it doesn't play like a typical RPG or RPG Maker style game. A lot of people um, they were like, "Is this was this made an RPG Maker?" And so I was like, "Yeah, yeah, it was." Like a lot of experienced people, because I was able to make a Pac Man style game with it, um, which you know, it, it definitely was was different. It's not something typically seen with the program. So it took me. It took me. It's a very simple game, very short. But it took me a month to figure out how to do it. Um, and then once I figured out how to do it, I was able to essentially develop the second one in a week. So, wow. Yeah. So so a lot of this was all learning. A lot of this was just learning because every game, there's something new and there's something improved in it. So metal as fuck. It took me six months. I can probably make it in one month now. Um, same with Chronicles of Quiverdick. I had to learn a lot of new things with that one, and that took nine months. I could probably do it in one month as well. Um, to to, but, piggy, to piggyback off of that real quick, and I apologize to cut you off. One mm-hmm. of the things, one of the things that you said earlier was that uh, you were the the reason that the deported games came about was because you were a little tired of doing RPGs, correct? Yeah, yeah. I wanted. I just wanted to try something different. I needed a break. And you know. Going off of, off of that, are there like basically what I want to ask is when you set out to make a game, is it you know the majority of them have been have been RPGs, but is there a, a specific gameplay loop that you want to develop? And let's say for example, if there are features or are there are things that are that are left on the cutting room floor, do you take those ideas and migrate them to your other games going forward? Or, or try to have a you know like a little kernel of an idea that was left over that you move forward to other games like what's that process like? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, <clears throat> so when I'm writing the story for a game, I'm typically making up as I go along. Um, if I like, I, I, I get an infinite amount of ideas. I don't get writer's block anymore. That's not something that I've had to deal with for a very long time. Um, I have a ridiculous amount of games, game ideas at least floating around that. You know, could, I think that they could all be pretty decent, um, and I don't have enough time to develop all of them. So I definitely mix and match and pull apart different ideas and different storylines and put them into different games. Um, so yeah, there's there's a lot of that, um, but I typically write as I go along. So for example, uh, Deported One and Two, I wrote them both in about a day, and then the development was what took them longer. Um, the Damn Daniel script I wrote in about, I would say, three days. Um, metal as fuck. I wrote, I would say I wrote that one in probably a week. Chronicles of Quiverdick. Um, that one, that one was uh, a lot of, a lot of writing. It's just a lot of different separate scenes. That one probably took the longest just because I was developing as I was going along and writing it rather than just writing it out and then developing. Um but but yeah, so so the writing portion of it is by far the easiest. When I sit down, I typically can just write for 12 straight hours and, and let that be a script done, time to develop. Um, it, that's the part that comes naturally to me. The development part, it's, it's why I, like when, when people say I'm a game developer, I, I use that like I, you know, technically I am, but I think that it should be uh, taken with a grain of salt. I, I don't consider myself to really be a developer. Um, it's the part of, you know, of making games that I hate the most, probably. Um, really? Yeah, yeah. I'm not. It's it's extremely frustrating. I mean, I've I've spent seventy two straight hours trying to figure out a three second problem before. It's it's very aggravating, and a lot of people, that's what they like about it, you know. And those to me are the real developers. Those are the people that actually like that shit. I can't stomach it. <laughs> but yeah. <clears throat> You know, um, okay, so the so the problem solving you would say is an issue. Real quick about the story, you say that you write your stories first, so the narrative is is very strong in your games. It's what leads you to make the games. Mm-hmm. Do you waver at all in terms of when you meet a development challenge or obstacle, and you say, "Wait a minute, I've got to rewrite this section of the story," or do you just stick to it? All the time, yeah. Um, and unless like, but that's the. That's what I think I pride myself on the most is being able to adapt. You know, if I write a story one way, um, I'm very, very, very good at 
modifying it and changing it and branching it if I need to, to suit development needs. Like, for example, um, every one of my games, I write jokes around things that I lacked in development-wise. Like, for example, there's um, in the Chronicles of Quiver Dick, there's a, there's a scene where, um, where you put the key in the door and the door shatters. I um, loved it. Every door. So, <laughs> so so you the door shatters i wrote a joke around it um a lot of people were like oh man you know i really love that joke because it's like a it's like making fun of old school rpgs where you know back in the day whenever you would open a door the door would just disappear you know it was just there was no door swinging open or anything. the door would just be gone for the rest of the game so they were like oh that's you know it's funny well done there um, and then also, if, even if people don't remember that, I still wrote a dialogue and scene around that part, you know, to try and add some humor and story into the game and and stuff. <laughs> in reality, I couldn't figure out how to get the door to work the way I wanted it to. So I added in a breaking door sound effect and wrote a joke around my poor development skills. So, <laughs> so, so that lady behind the counter is like, you're fucking paying for that. Yeah, yeah right, right. <laughs> You know, so so that's basically like again, I'm not the best developer, but I'm I'm pretty good at making it look like my mistakes and accidents are meant to be there. So that's awesome, man. That's that's crazy. So I guess uh, diving into the next topic, I, like I said, I watched uh, you put out a video a couple hours ago. Actually, I, I didn't see the exact time, but it was it was today, and uh, you went into you know how much you make as a developer. Mm-hmm. Uh, um, and it, it, it's not much. And forgive me for disclosing it, but I know you, you put it out there already. Mm-hmm. So you can mm-hmm. so you you take it out. Now, I guess the, the the question behind this would be like, what, like, why? You know what I mean? What the hell? Mm-hmm. I know I, you probably love it, but what drives you? Well, all right. So <clears throat> a couple of things. One, because I know that if I were to go working at like a, a nine to five job and, and things, you know, my parents were very hard working. They, they worked very, very hard their whole lives. Um, you know, my dad wrecked his body. He built every house I ever lived in. He had a very strong work ethic. Even after he retired, he still worked every day of his life. Um, my mother was a manager of a store um, for 15 years, a surf shop. And she worked ridiculous hours, never got paid overtime, very small wage, um, and shitty work conditions. And uh, But she just always worked and worked. So my parents were always working. Um, they, I, they had a lot to show for um, what they worked, but I also saw how it affected them later in their lives, too. Um, you know, your body can only handle so much and, and uh, so on and so forth. And there comes a point where you're just not going to be able to work. Um, so I really wanted to go down the road of investing my time now into something that doesn't really have a, a cap or a ceiling on it. Um, you know, I figured I could go and do the same thing Um you know, a lot of people do, and there's there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of jobs out there. I most certainly appreciate other people doing. I wouldn't want to do them, um, and I you know it's I, I will gladly take a pay cut right now, um, and uh, and not complain about it. Um, eventually, that will turn into something much bigger. Eventually, I won't be making eleven thousand. Eventually, I'll be making a hundred. Um, and so on and so forth, you know, and it'll, there's no cap. It's only, it's only how much am I putting in is, is what I'll get out in the end. You know, um, I, I set a five year plan, um, or five year goal, um, kind of in the works when I, when I started and I was like, at the end of the five years, I can be expecting to make this much based on my, my first game sales and, and things, um, if I can recreate this and do that, then I know I'll be making this much. Um, minimum. That's the worst case scenario. That's if I don't get a hit. If I don't get any sort of hit game that goes far or whatever, you know, I can at least expect to get this. Worst case scenario. Um, and I just looked at every job option out there, and I was like, at the end of five years, I could I could be making the same amount pretty much. Um, doing something like that, or I in five years I can make 
twice as much, three times as much as when I started. Um, and on top of that, that money is going to be coming in whether I'm developing games or not. I can go on vacation and still get paid that money, you know? Right. Um, so so that's kind of what what motivates me to continue working really, really, really hard now. So by the time, you know, that time rolls around, I, I won't have to work so hard, you know? Um, at least in theory, we'll see. Yeah, I have to say I'm pretty impressed, man. You're, 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 you know, you said you laid out a five-year plan. You're, you're banking on something that's not guaranteed, right? And mm-hmm. uh, um, obviously, like you're sacrificing your mental health because <laughs> eleven thousand—that's that's no money, dude. That's yeah. none. And yeah. and you know that. I, I saw you even acknowledge in your in your video, like, hey, I could go work at McDonald's and make more a year than what I'm making now. Absolutely. So credit to your credit to your commitment, man, for real, mm-hmm. and your drive to make these games. Because even I'm not willing to do that. Like, <clears throat> I want this podcast to take off. I want our shit to grow. But I, yeah, that's that's amazing, man. I, I have nothing but respect for that. So I appreciate sure. it. I don't know if these guys want. Anything. So let me ask you this then, since you are thinking about your five year plan. So as a developer, what is your take on microtransactions? Uh, as far as microtransactions goes, um, I it's real <laughs> it's real Very tempting slow. it's real tempting as a developer to put them into my games because that sounds like some nice money, but you know I also don't want to be a dick. So <laughs> um, you know I I think that microtransactions. Uh, there's there's certainly a market out there for them, you know. Like touch with them, you know. I think that I think mobile. that it's yeah yeah. I think that that's the way to go. If you're going to release a mobile game, you know, I think that as a developer, you'd be silly from a business perspective not to use microtransactions. Um, yeah. I I don't blame any developer for using them. I don't I I don't think that I would want to, okay. but um, but I would. Uh, I'm not saying I wouldn't do it. I'm okay. just saying I, I don't think I would want to. Um, and I think that I think a lot of people hate them, but there's always the the thing the thing that I think people need to to understand is that um, it seems like a lot of people hate them because they're very vocal about it. But the people that are satisfied are staying quiet, you mm-hmm. know. That's right. And, and that's kind of the way it works with everything. It's the same thing with reviews. When I when I said about one in 150 people leave a review, that's not even guaranteed to be a positive. That's just a review. It's actually harder to get positive reviews than it is negative because the positive customers are walking away satisfied. It's like you go to a restaurant. How many people do you hear complain about their food and send it back and say, you know, I don't like my meal, but then compare it to how many people go in the back and and like thank the chef for their awesome meal that they made and say that was really amazing you know no they really stay quiet and they they stay quiet they say i enjoyed that and they'll come back for more eventually you know but sounds like yelp reviews really yeah mm -hmm. yeah yeah basically um so i would say as far as microtransactions goes i actually read some statistics on it before and the vast majority i think it's a very very small percentage it's most certainly less than one percent of everybody that plays these free games with microtransactions less than one percent actually purchase microtransactions but the ones that do typically spend quite a lot of money um they subsidize everything else for everybody yeah. right yeah and, Mm-hmm. And so we've gone into that on this show before too, like you know, rising mm-hmm. costs of development and all that stuff. And even your games, such you know, they're smaller indie titles. They they certainly cost you some money. So sure, yeah. So it's hard to blame these developers. I guess wanting to make an extra buck or two. Yeah, absolutely. And it's one of those things. I'm if I were to ever do microtransactions for any games or something, I would feel like. I'd feel like there's there's a right way to do them and a wrong way to do them. I'm all in favor of microtransactions for something that gives an aesthetic type uh, thing or whatever. Like, for example, Overwatch, you know? Overwatch, you, you can buy some skins. If you want your character to look different or something, then, you know, if you want to if you want to buy some loot boxes or something and then go for it. But something that I think that gives you an unfair advantage over another player that's got less money, I think that it takes a little bit of the spirit of gaming out of it. Um, you know, so I, I don't, I personally stay away from games that are pay to win. Um, I don't find that to be very enjoyable. Um, but, but I think that there's, I think that 
there's there's room for microtransactions and stuff, and um, I think it, it just depends on how they're implemented, really. Gotcha. Makes sense, you know. Uh, uh, you, it was a very honest response from somebody who's from the other side, you know. Uh, we mm-hmm. tend to see it from just from the perspective of the gamer, but sometimes, you know, the developer has to get paid. And mm. sometimes microtransactions can be the one way that they help them keep you know food on the table. So mm-hmm. for me, it's like you know it's it's decent. Uh, I, I respect and, and, you for that. And mm. I think that mentality, although some may disagree when they hear this, I think that mentality also extends to uh, optically it may not, but I think that also extends to AAA game developers, where we see like Marlon mentioned, the rising cost of game development has skyrocketed, mm. and AAA games have been the same price ostensibly since 2005 since the xbox 360 with 59.99 price point mm-hmm. right and I, and I think that has begetted uh season passes and microtransactions and these some of these predatory type practices where they need to eke out money from somewhere mm-hmm. but uh we'll see we'll see uh, i'm glad i'm glad that you gave that take on on microtransactions i'm glad that you were adamant about not having a pay to win model and, uh, and speaking of which you're only on steam Although I believe that one of your games you said is on Google Play, correct? Sure. Yep. Have Have you ever thought of probably porting your games to mobile? See, seeing seeing how that is such a such a big audience, and and what the pricing scheme for that may entail. Sure. Okay. So um, Google Play, I believe, actually takes a a smaller cut than Steam does. Um, however, there's you know, there's it's a whole nother market. There's a whole nother audience for it. Um, the money that I get from Google Play is nowhere near the money I get from Steam. Nowhere near it. Um, but that's also because my presence on Google Play is not nearly as big. I only have one game there, and I haven't pushed it very heavy. Um, you know, not heavy at all. So I would say that I would say that Google Play probably has just as much advantage. Um, as Steam, depending on if the developer is going to push their product. Um, I think that all of my games really should go on mobile as well. There's no reason for them not to be, other than um, I didn't do the porting for the first game. Um, I'll have to look into getting somebody to do the porting for the rest of them, but I I would absolutely love to have them um, on mobile as well. There's no reason for me not to. The work, the work, A lot of the work's already done in the development. It's just porting them. Um, you do have to go through and, and change some things to make them work properly on mobile. Um, you know, but, uh, but yeah, um, it would just be more, more income for me if I were to just port them all over. Um, so. so let me ask you this. Uh, besides RPGs, what type of game that you would love to develop like in the, in the near future? Like uh, style or a dream, a dream game, considering you have all the time and budget in the world. <laughs> yeah, it, you know it's funny. Um, uh, Yasmin Kaleidoscope Games just asked me this question two days ago. <laughs> um, she, you know, she said you've got no no time limit, you know, budget uh, to do whatever you want. You know, you can make whatever you want. What would you make? And I said I've had an idea for a game for a long time, and it's a. Uh, it's a horror slash romance slash like uh, I would say it's it's a lot like The Last of Us in a way. Um, it would be very emotionally uh, it would be it'd be mer- very emotionally driven. I think that if I can make anything, um, I would go down a serious route and and make something very long um, with, with a lot of horror in it. You know, I think that, I think that that's really where, where my calling is. Um, the reason why I went into comedy was again, a lot for, it, it was a piece of me, but it was also a lot for business. Um, I was working with what I, um, you know, but basically just using the cards I was dealt. Um, it was a simple engine. I learned it. Um, I did a lot of market research before I started game development. I actually surveyed over a thousand different people and I asked them a bunch of questions, over 120 questions, um, each and, uh, got all these people volunteered to, uh, you know, I said, look, I'm going to be making a game. I want to make the best game I can possibly make. Um, what do you, what would you want to see? And I asked like, do you prefer sci-fi fantasy 
Um, you know, do you like steampunk universe? Do you like this? Do you like that? Do you like turn-based combat? Do you like voice acting in games versus not? So anyways, after loads, just lots of months of doing this research, I went through and I looked and almost everything was split right down the middle 50-50. And I was like, well, fuck. Like, that doesn't help me a lot, you know? <laughs> like, like, how am I supposed to make this perfect game? You know, I thought that I was going to be able to... And then, and then I kind of realized, well, no, it actually it helps a lot because no matter what, you're never going to please everybody. As a matter of fact, there's going to be a lot of unsatisfied people, but there's a lot of people that are going to like, you know, this too. So I thought, okay, fuck the questions and the list and what people want. What is something that everybody has in common? You know, because obviously people, they may not, um, they may not enjoy turn-based combat or they may not enjoy, uh, voice acting in games versus not voice acted and stuff. But what is something that would be undeniable for everybody? And I thought, well, it would be really hard for people to hate something that they're laughing and smiling at. Mm -hmm. So if I go the route of comedy, everybody likes to laugh, you know? And I thought if I can make people laugh as long as I can hit that mark, they can forgive how shitty everything else is. So I very much went with the South Park model where they said crap is funny. It doesn't have to look good. If it's making people laugh, they're going to like it. Um, so that's that's basically what I did. I went the comedy route because if I can make people laugh and smile, then it's hard to leave a negative review when you're smiling. You know, it's it's hard to say you're not enjoying yourself if you're if you're smiling. That's the whole point of playing games is to enjoy yourself and to you know to to get something out of it. So and I think some gamers are partial yeah. to that too when reviewing games. I mean, I certainly am. You know, when I'll play a game, it may have a little bit of jank, but if it did make me laugh and I did feel a connection to it, some of those some of that I'll, I'm I will let slide. Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that is the thing I noticed and appreciated when I played your game. I feel like, especially with a lot of these bigger companies, you know, movie, movies, games, whatever, there's kind of a disconnect between, like, you know, the developers and the and the, and the actual consumer. Mm -hmm. Now, when I played your game, man, I, that humor was so relatable to me, man. Like, that's the mm -hmm. shit I say. That's you know what I mean. That's the shit like right. I find funny. Like, so it was it was it was refreshing from that you know that standpoint. So mm -hmm. it was actually really cool, man. Mm -hmm. I really, I've only played the one game. I played, I played the Chronicles of Quiverdick, and immediately, man, I'm laughing my ass off. Like that fucking scene at the at the table right at the beginning. Yeah, just yeah. instantly just just starts off ripping, man. It was it was good. Yeah, so, well, I appreciate it. Yeah. It only took me about you know two and a half hours to get through it. I think maybe a little longer. I can't I can't remember exactly, but it it was it was worth it. So. Sure. That was yeah. a thing too. Yeah, like, you know your bundle. You know how much that bundle costs when it's when there's no sales going on, or there's always a sale, right? There's always one game on sale. But uh, yeah, for the most part, I think I think um, actually I think next week or something. There's no sales. There's just a very um, you know because I had two games on sale for one week or whatever, which leaves a a week out that that nothing will be on sale. But um, yeah, so so the the price of all of them individually. Let's see, five. Six, seven, eight, nine, ten. I eleven. I think eleven dollars total. Or mm, hmm. <clears throat> Let's see. There's so there's two, five, ten, twelve. Twelve bucks. Twelve bucks if it's uh, if if you buy them all individually. Um, otherwise, it's twenty percent off. So you get it for under twelve bucks for for all six games. Um, I tried to price the games at about a dollar an hour. Um, I felt, you know, I felt like that's if I were playing a game, if I got an hour of gameplay for each dollar, I'd be happy with it. So that's typically how I try to price them. Yeah, makes sense. Yeah, I, I've I've very much felt that that game, that one game alone, was worth the I think ten seventy two or something that I pay or eleven. I don't remember exactly what it was. It's been a few months, but that one game alone, I felt you know two and a half hours. I thought it was worth it. And you can I, play through that again and still enjoy it. So, I I appreciate it. But yeah, that's definitely something different. I'm not even really like a big indie game guy. You know what I mean? I don't have a whole lot of time. I know it's kind of weird. We we run this this video game podcast, but I don't have a ton of time to play games, especially in the mm -hmm. summertime. So I typically, you know, I stick to my my bigger games that I get to play, and uh, it was nice, man. I I really enjoyed it. So 
Well, uh, thank you for uh, thank you for giving it a shot. For talking about Absolutely. video games and your video games in general, is there any Easter eggs or secrets that people have not found out in most of your games that you will know about it? There, at least from what I've seen, because a lot of people stream them. A lot. I think it comes it comes as a surprise just how many people stream them. Because there's a lot of people that have streamed them that I have never watched before or met or spoken to. Um, I just like go on Twitch and I type in metal as fuck and I look at all past broadcasts and stuff and I'm like, oh shit, like another you know eight <laughs> people, eight people have you know streamed this one and I missed it. Um, <clears throat> you know. But out of all of the ones that I've watched, and I try to catch as many of them as I can, it gets really difficult, but um, out of all the ones I've watched, there's never been a single player who has who has not missed something. Um, Metal as Fuck has over 300 Easter eggs in it alone. Damn. So so that one is, is definitely, it's got a lot of hidden stuff. Um, I would say probably... Um, collectively there's probably nothing that hasn't been found gotcha. by by anybody but i don't think that any single person has found everything i'd i'd be surprised if they did oh, yeah that makes sense. Oh, i like that's, that that's pretty cool so you, you mentioned that you have this five-year plan mm-hmm. and that's great uh, you know that you're working towards this goal but two questions have you ever considered because the games that you've put out i can see that there's a clear passion for them and most importantly you've put out games that you would want to play as a gamer. Mm-hmm. And I think that probably is your guiding light. You know, you have mentioned that, hey, I, I went the route of comedy for business purposes, but sure. within that sandbox, you've managed to make games that you have wanted to not only make, but play. Right. Have you ever considered putting out a more mainstream game to, that appeals to more people? And have you ever considered probably, instead of being an indie game developer, working for some development studio in order to probably get a little more experience that you can maybe relay into the future, you know, and go into indie again? Just a thought mm-hmm. out there. I think that I think that if I were to work for a development studio, I would only sign on as a writer and not a developer. Um, and I think that it would have to be it would have to be a, a decent enough. Um, pay you know um because i feel like i've got something pretty good going right now i think i've got something as little as i'm making right now i know that like as as scary as that number may seem i guarantee it's 10 times what what the majority of other developers in my position are making um it's you know they're making pennies it's that's just the that's the reality of it and i know that eventually i'll be able to take the idea that i've built right now and turn it into something really big um so so i think it would very much depend i'm not opposed to the idea under certain circumstances um as far as as far as making something more mainstream mm, i don't know i really like I, I don't like censorship. I don't like um, selling out. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know, and you know, as much as as much as the comedy thing was for for business purposes, I still think that I would have made it anyways. Um, it may not have been the first thing that I made if I had an unlimited budget and stuff, or but it's still a part of me. It's very much a part of me. It's still something I enjoy doing, and and I think that. Even if I were to branch out and make that um, that serious game that I really want to work on, I think I would come right back to comedy after. Um, you know, That's it awesome. just you know I think that I think that um, like even when I was learning, I was making comedy games. Even when I was learning, I was watching South Park and I was watching you know um, just all the shows on Adult Swim, and I just. Um, I was always listening to the most vulgar of comedians. You know, they're always my favorite and. Yeah, you know, absolutely. I just Paul I was just mm-hmm. I I was just thinking I was just thinking, you know, there there just needs to be more of this but in gaming. And you know, I think that that's also I I know we're not really talking about Twitter too much, but I think that's also why I kind of have grown really big on Twitter a lot faster is because I I always say the things that people are thinking but too afraid to say. Yeah. Uh, I I can yeah. definitely definitely relate to that. <laughs> mm-hmm. and i and i think that i think that's really important because i think that a lot of people they can relate to the things that you say and they can agree and they can follow and stuff whenever i tweet something that's um 
that's controversial. I do get I do get a handful of people that are that are very argumentative. I get a lot of people more and more every day that block me on Twitter, but I um, I also get a lot of new followers, and I also get the posts get a lot of likes, and all of those likes those are silent approval, you know. So I kind of I kind of I'll be honest I'll be you know not to get into the weeds of this but I kind of hate those si- you know those silent approvals. I think I think those are probably worse than, than the people who protest and 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 give you shit back because at least you know where those folks are coming from as opposed to the other folks who just for whatever reason just don't have them in, in them to just say what needs to be said. I I think that I th- I, I think I think regardless of that, I think the ones that are the worst are the ones that um, that simply agree with everything you're saying, laugh, and then scroll without hitting like because they're too afraid for that to pop up on their feed. You know, I think right. that, that I get people that have sent me DMs and said, "Hey, look, you know, I'm family friendly and everything, and I, I laugh at all the stuff you say, but you know, I just I can't I can't like it, I can't retweet it or whatever. But just to let you know, like I think it's really you know good good for you. You know, that would that would and, drive me nuts. <laughs> <laughs> and and it's like it's it's like you know it's it, it puts me in an awkward position because I'm like you know I appreciate you know I appreciate that you like what I'm doing or whatever you know it's just it's at the same time it's yeah. a little bit you know it's not it's not genuine. Um, yeah, thank but, you. You know, it goes yeah, back I, to you saying you know be yourself or whatever. That's how you, that's how you've built your following. You know, you, you you've let loose. Obviously, you say what you want to say, and uh, we've we've kind of we followed that model, um, not necessarily you know verbatim, but. Like for a while, we've grown quite a bit in the last few months. Obviously, we're not to your level yet, but uh, and it's just because we we've started posting things like that. We've started posting like about who we are, like what kind of show we're putting out there, and uh, sure. we've definitely noticed we've noticed it. So like, <clears throat> that's obviously like one of the best things you can say to like a, a, a someone who's trying to grow or someone who's trying to like make it in this this industry or whatever they're trying to do. Absolutely. So mm-hmm. yeah, I think uh, that goes that goes a long way for sure. Well, yeah, and you know, a lot of times, I would say that it's, I would say that it's even slower progress by being yourself. But I don't know if that's necessarily the case. I think that. Sorry, one sec. No, you're fine. I think that uh, actually, a lot of people gimp themselves by, by playing a role. Um, you know, I think that. I think a lot of people they they think okay this is what people like so this is what I'm gonna be and that's the route to more viewers or or whatever um, in streaming and stuff and that's just simply not the case um, and I think that that's why the people who are more real end up growing a lot further because there's not enough of that you know yeah. there's like Hollywood is filled with fake personalities um, there's not enough real people. Um, and that's what I think more so than, I mean, entertainment is a lot of things, but, but real, um, is a commodity that we don't get enough of. And I think that, I think that, um, I, I think that there's a lot of people who pander, but I think that people aren't stupid and they'll sniff out a fake, um, eventually, and it doesn't take long. And I think that there's a big reason why a lot of streamers, especially, who run a certain tr- channel and uh, and have a certain theme, they just don't last forever because you can't keep it up forever, you know? At least if you're just being yourself, that's something that you can wake up and be every day, you know? It's not, it's not a face you have to put on. It doesn't take effort or work. Yeah. Um, you know, you, it's something that whether you're whether you're happy or sad, you can still go to work as yourself. Um, you don't have to put on that face. So I think that um, I think that a lot of streamers fail because they they're so afraid of whether people are going to like them or not that they they just want people's approval, you know. And I think that the reason why I've grown really really fast is because I don't care. I don't. I just simply don't care if somebody likes what I have to say or not. That their their approval doesn't 
doesn't affect yeah like it's i I, i'm not going to change the way i say things or or feel about something just because somebody disagrees and that's fine and if somebody wants to disagree it doesn't mean that we have to fight about it either you know that's fine like um you know and um we can we can disagree sure you know and and i think that too many people are afraid of conflict i think that that's a big one too is people are afraid of conflict but conflict is healthy you know yes yes conflict is very healthy i thrive on it absolutely yeah (laughs) yeah absolutely like like uh even here, like on in our, on our own pages, there's five of us, and we don't always agree. We we go at it sometimes, but we're all friends at the end of the day. We don't. Sure. We mm-hmm. have five different personalities running this one page, and that's mm-hmm. that's at the end of the day, that's all we care about. We we, we want to get the followers, we want to get the listens and the downloads and all that stuff. But at the end of the day, we get together and we talk about we talk we get to talk about video games and shit with our friends on a on a podcast. So right, right. Yeah. So yeah, and. Like I said, disagree, fine, but you don't have to hate each other for it. Right. We've we've learned that. So Yeah. Yeah. And and I I guess I, I kinda rambled a little bit. I just remember the point I was trying to make at the beginning. Uh so so basically there's there's that saying that being honest won't always get you the most friends, but it'll always get you the right ones. Yes. Um so I feel like that's the same with being genuine as far as what your content is. Because if you're playing the role of something, um, you're gonna build a fan base and eventually that facade is gonna wear down and then everybody's gonna see what it is and then you're gonna lose your fan base. You know, it, it you can't keep it up forever. Whereas if people just like you for for what you you're actually putting out there, that's not going to go away. You're building real true support, and even if you're building it slower, those are the ones that are going to support you regardless. You know, yeah. Um, that's just not going to just go away. You, know? you, you make you make you're making yeah. some really you're, you're making some really really good points here, especially you know I I, I follow you on Twitter and I, I keep up with your tweets and <laughs> you do come off as genuine you know you don't come off as phony, and you mentioned that you know sometimes sometimes these content creators these folks on Twitter and YouTube and Twitch they put on a mask you know to go to work, mm-hmm. but one of the one of the new masks that I that I feel that they're putting on is that one of being genuine. It's sort of virtue signaling, like hey I'm genuine just like these other folks, and it's sort of hard to tell who's who. Yeah. But like you mentioned, you can always sniff. You can always sniff yeah. a fake out. You can't. You can't keep it up uh, forever. Yeah. If yeah. you have to tell, if you have to tell people you're real, then you're not. You know. You're like, not really. Yeah. No. You know, it's it's one of those things. Yeah. Uh, people. And and the thing is, is I, I've I've never come out and said I'm real or I keep it real or whatever. I think it's ridiculous because even me, even even me. Uh, coming out there and doing it that's still it's only one side of me you know like like Mm -hmm. twitter and stuff that's still a lot of people think that it's a persona well no it's not a persona it's just that and if it is it's still a real part of me but it's only one part of me you know a lot of people come into my streams and they're like after reading your tweets i didn't expect you to be so soft-spoken and calm and things like that well it's just another side of me you know they're so they're so they're so quick to try to pigeonhole people and, mm-hmm. and you know, in this this aspect that you present on Twitter, you know that you know that's who you are by default. That that doesn't necessarily hold muster all the time. It's not necessarily true. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's a uh, so it's something that um, I was taught early on when when getting into the internet and just social media as a whole is that always people always tell me like, oh no, my, my online persona is much more different than my offline persona. And I'm going, why? That That's mm-hmm. stupid. You know, you, you should be yeah. yourself, whether it's online or offline. It's, it's keeping it as honest as it can be. That's what's going to make you show that you are genuine. It's going to mm-hmm. show that you yeah. are a person that <clears throat> may have different opinions about certain subjects but mm. it is an, an honest opinion it is not a a, a facade it's not a fake something that just trying to like a piece for likes as opposed to just somebody who's actually you know hey you know this guy is kind of cool mm-hmm. it's Our, yeah but that's so just my so just ra- just wrapping up real quick um once again i want to thank you for coming on the show man I, I know you're busy you've got a lot of shit going on um working all these hours for you know what i mean developing these games making these games twitter streaming all that stuff so i appreciate it, man i really do well again thank um, you Vern, for inviting me 
Um, and real quick before we do close off, um, you've got a new game coming out. Um, mm. So if you want to if you want to plug that real quick, uh, let us know what it is. Um, obviously, I've seen you post on Twitter, but definitely want to talk about that a little bit before we close out here. Plug sure. everything, brother. <clears throat> yeah, plug everything for sure. Well, um, all right. So I've got I've got a couple of games. Um, one of them is called Rome Built in a Day. Um, I saw that. <laughs> that, yeah, that was that was a challenge that I was trying to accomplish, where I could just stay up for twenty four hours and build a game from start to finish. Um, I fell asleep, <laughs> so I, I didn't I didn't quite make it in, in a twenty four hour stretch. But I came back to it um, after after waking up, and I was like, all right, I'll just start the clock, and you know, I've got fourteen hours left. Let's see what I can get done. Um, truth be told, I was able to get the skeleton out, you know, um, for the game, but I, I, there's no way that I could have made the game the way that it is. And, and in 24 hours where it was like bug free and, and grammatically correct, you know what I mean? Like there's a lot yeah. of stuff that like, it needs to be play tested. It has to be play tested and I can't be the only one to play test it. I, I'll miss things. Like I just can't release a product after, that short of a time period and so i would say that overall it was built in a day but if if we want to get technical and say it's the the rough draft even a little bit further than the rough draft was built in a day um but to make it like polished and actually feel good and everything and where all the, you know there's no mistakes and no bugs and no glitches and stuff um yeah it, it's it takes a little bit more than a day i can't just do something like that especially because i was a little bit overly ambitious with it i think that i after working on it and seeing how fast i can progress because i can tell you what i was able to accomplish in a day would have taken me three months when i first started so i've i've learned a ridiculous amount so i can tell you that if i were to try it again i i wouldn't be able to do this type of game built in a day but i would be able to build something smaller i think um something shorter something that's maybe 30 minutes to an hour long i could probably manage to finish in a day um you know but yeah so i missed my mark a little bit on this one it was close but but still still a little bit of a miss and then i've also got um quiverdick's epic book of fairy tales um that one i'm pretty excited about i think that that's probably going to be my the best thing i've released so far um it's also going to be, I'm aiming for it to be longer um, than anything else I've released. Um, it's it's a, an idea that I've had in the works for a couple of years, and I just started developing it. Um, but the entire story is all written out and everything. It's ready to go. It's just developing it, just piecing everything together, probably getting Red Mouse to do some artwork for it, some custom stuff. She already did the title screen. I've already got a teaser trailer out. The store page is up. Um you know, so um, looking forward to releasing that one um, as soon as possible. But it's got some work that needs to be put into it still. Um, other than those two, um, you know, I'm going to be I'm, I'm going to continue working on those, get them fixed, finished. Um, Steam actually declined Rome built in a day based on a couple of things. So I've got to I've got to make some adjustments. Another reason why it it just no matter what it wouldn't be finished in in a single day because there's always unforeseen things um, that need to be fixed up. Um, but nothing that's not you know can't be managed. Um, I would say you know I I stream on Twitch every once in a while. Um, if anybody wants to follow that Crankage Games. Um, Right now, I've been really trying to um, push singing lessons um, that Yasmin, Kaleidoscope Games, is doing. You can find her on Twitter, Kaleidoscope Games, uh, is it Kaleidoscope GS, I think? Um, I think but, so. We, we retweet a lot of her stuff as well, so we yeah. can help out too. Yeah, I've I'm heard sure her voice, so. so. Yeah, thank yeah, you. Absolutely. We gotta get with her to make our own uh, AEG theme song. We're we're gonna mm-hmm. once we figure that out, we're gonna we're gonna get on that. So, <laughs> right. Um, but but yeah. So if anybody if anybody wants singing lessons, you know, she's your girl. Does one on one singing lessons. Um, it's uh, it, it's definitely it's she fills up so quick. Like there's there's so many there's there's it's crazy. I actually didn't. 
I expected there to be interest, but I didn't expect there to be so much. Um, yeah. So um, she's she's getting new students every single day, and she's uh, extremely talented. So I like I said, I've heard I've heard her voice on a few a few different tracks, and it's it's pretty amazing, man. So I, I definitely will. definitely give her a shout from us for sure. I, I absolutely will, and she'll watch this too. You know, she she wanted to be here and listening in and stuff, but people will sing again. <laughs> <laughs> And, and and her rates are half the going rate of everybody else that's in her field. So, you know, that's another reason people are, are snatching those up. Eventually, the price is going to increase. Her time is, is becoming more and more limited. But she'll uh, she'll honor whatever price somebody signed up for is how much they'll get. They'll get that price forever, you know. Um, so, um, but and yeah. Another thing, um, since I'm sure you're not going to really want to do this, but... Uh... He's also got a Patreon. Um, if you've got the extra funds, go over there and uh, support him. Um, you're on uh, Streamlabs as well, right? Um, so um, if you guys have a, you know, I, it sucks like having to do this, but no, support him. Give Michael your money. Do it now. Do yeah, it give him right your money. Now. I appreciate um, this. Su- support this guy. Uh, support they got him. a lot. You got a lot going on and stuff like that. So definitely, you have our support for sure. Thank so. you. Yeah, it means a lot. Like um, instead of supporting EA's crappy business model at times, <laughs> you can give it to Michael. You know he will make you laugh. EA will just leave make you reviews. Cry. <laughs> leave reviews. Yeah, reviews. Super important reviews. Yeah. Uh, so uh, yeah, if beautiful. nobody has anything to add, I think that's gonna do it um, for this week's episode. Um, everyone that listened, we appreciate it. Um, thank you again, Crankage, for coming on the show, uh, Michael. I guess we Thank call you, you Michael. Thanks, Thank you thanks so much. again, man. Mm-hmm. Thank you. And we'll let Gustavo close it out. Yeah, so basically just we, we all we all thank you for coming on the show. It's 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 tough calling you Michael because I've been calling you crank for so long on our own <laughs> uh on our own little uh Discord. But yeah, for the listeners out there, go support Michael, subscribe to, to his Twitch, buy his games, leave reviews. And that's it for this week. We'll see you on the next show. <laughs>